Glasgow, Scotland's the host for COP26, also known as the United Nations Climate Change Conference. The event brings together 25,000 leaders from around the world to discuss the impact of climate change and extreme weather with a name to finding solutions. In 2015, consensus was reached to keep global warming below a two degree increase with an aim at 1.5 to avoid a climate emergency. Canada is represented at COP26 with a number of promises made. Will they make any difference? Hello and welcome to the Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. We're coming to you from a remote location of practicing physical distancing to enhance safety. More than 200 countries are in attendance at the conference. Prime Minister Trudeau has made some ambitious promises, which will have a financial impact here. A hard cap on emissions for the oil and gas industry was announced, along with encouragement for other countries to follow Canada's lead on pricing carbon. International aid from Canada is earmarked for poorer countries to help meet their pollution targets. Our unpublished vote question asks you, will Canada's pledges at COP26 make a difference in climate change? Yes, no, or unsure. You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote and have your voice heard. Coming up on the Unpublished Cafe, we'll talk with Dan McTagg, President of Canadians for Affordable Energy. As well, Douglas Alt of the University of Guelph will join us. But first, we're joined by Angela Keller Herzog. She's Executive Director of Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability. And Angela, Canada is making a lot of promises at COP26, despite having a poor record at reducing emissions and meeting targets. How can it have any credibility? Well, that's that's a good question. And, and I think that in the international community, there is... Um, a pretty high level of skepticism um, in terms of our handsome prime minister and to what degree the the promises are just talk and to what degree it, it will translate into political action. Now, arguably, having just, again, been confirmed as Canada's leader, um, and I think many Canadians um, understanding that part of the Liberal platform was about climate action, um, Justin Trudeau is in a position to make change. And with it comes a hard cap on emissions for the oil and gas sector, yet it subsidizes, it subsidizes the oil and gas industry. It seems it's taking from one end and giving to the other. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think that that's uh, something that needs to be untangled in terms of um, you know, what, what is a, a false narrative here and, and what really like makes sense. So if we look at it, hard cap, well, first of all, I'd like to know, is this going to be a hard, like any kind of hard caps within the current liberal electoral term? Or are we talking about 2025 and beyond when when we might expect that Canadians will actually want to change a government after so many liberal terms. Right. So let's let's hold their feet to the fire to be promising things within their term of governance. And and, and I think that we should apply that criteria at all levels of government. Right. Including our, our local government here in in Ottawa. Now, the next thing about emissions caps, as as you've hinted in your question, um, are we subsidizing on one hand so that with the carbon capture and storage, which is extremely expensive, um, we do reduce the emissions, but we have ongoing extraction and, and then export. And I think that when we look at the whole planetary equation, the physics of it, um, it doesn't matter if that ton of um, bitumen or natural gas is burned in the United States or in China or in Mali or in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. it, it contributes to the atmospheric um, CO2 levels. So if Canada is saying, oh, we're going to keep our emissions down because we're paying for this massive, massive subsidy, but then we export like crazy and it gets burned somewhere else, like that doesn't make any sense. Now, the oil and gas industry is a major economic driver in this country. Is there a way of impacting it or without a detrimental effect? I think that, again, if we follow the money, right, and we see where are big chunks of money being dedicated and where there is marginal support, um, so far, we haven't seen any sizable program for transition. 
the Liberals were supposed to bring through a transition act. So in, in the, the part of that, which is to support transition of oil and gas workers, we haven't really seen the effort. There was an earlier plan for, for workers in coal that, that um, was sort of a practice. Uh, so, so that remains outstanding. I, I would say that um, the contribution of the oil and gas sector to Canada's national economy is, is sometimes a bit exaggerated. Um, I think that it's it's a big chunk of our exports, yes, but in terms of the actual number of workers affected, it's maybe, I think the estimates are around four or 500,000. Um, and there's lots of other sectors that are comparable that have had to adjust over time. So I think that if we put support um, in that area, then from, from a worker perspective, that transition is, is manageable. And from a corporate perspective, I think that that's where the crunch comes. And um, I welcome more questions <laughs> on that front. But what I'm seeing is that oil and gas companies are saying that they are increasing their dividends they're buying back shares from the market to increase then their valuations. They have been benefiting from the pandemic um, financial assistance. They're getting new tax credit on the carbon storage. So it's like, I think that those guys are in a financially very sweet spot, all of which contradicts um, any kind of talk that Canada is starting to put economic pressure on our oil and gas industry to to stop extracting. All right. Decarbonizing the transportation industry. More than one quarter of our emissions come from this. What are the gaps to accomplishing it? I think that we have some promises for electric vehicle mandates. Um, clearly, the, the supply chain um, difficulties in the global economy are going to impact on um, transition to EV a bit. But from what I understand, for example, in our local market in Ottawa, it's now possible to get a secondhand um, Prius, for example, a few years old. So that's a new development, a secondhand market. Um, it's my understanding that um, certainly at the top end, electric vehicles are available. Um, and I think Hyundai's, um, things like that, you can buy. So if the government wanted to support, I think they should put more support also to things like electric bikes. Um, and we have heard that in Ottawa, there will be financing through the Infrastructure Bank of Canada support the transformation of our bus fleet to electric buses. Now, coal is targeted at COP26. More countries sign on to steer power generators away from coal, but if the three biggest users, uh, US, Russia, and China don't, is it going to make any difference? I, I think that that's a huge outstanding um, question mark, but I think that there is some pressure. Like if you have 170 countries sign on, then the big three ones, I, th I think they should be feeling some of that pressure. Again, starting at home, um, uh, let's see what happens in Canada in terms of our commitments to stop exporting coal. Um, from what I understand, the Port of Vancouver handles a considerable amount of coal exports. And again, um, in terms of the emissions measurement that, that our, our smart um, technocrats have devised, for the Canadian emissions, it's the emissions that are the energy and burnt in the process of extracting. But if we export it to another country and it's burnt there, that goes into their emissions data. But globally, we like we're all stuck with those emissions. So we need to start um, in terms of the narrative in the media. We understand that Canadian emissions so far have not gone down, but my point is that we're not even counting all that Canada is contributing in terms of our um, oil, gas, and coal being exported and then burnt elsewhere. Angela, I want to thank you for joining us. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you.
Angela Keller Herzog's executive director of Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability. As mentioned, the oil and gas sector in Canada will face the promises made by the Prime Minister when it comes to a hard cap on emissions. Dan McTagg is the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy, and he joins us now. And Dan, one quarter of Canada's emissions directly from that industry. Without a hard cap, how do you bring them down? Well, you do it by through carbon taxes, through existing regulations. Uh, you do it through a clean fuel standard. Look, there's a number of uh, initiatives that have already taken place. Uh, of course, the backdrop on this Ed, is not that I've ever worked in the industry. I've been a friend of the industry, but their emissions are down 30% in the past decade. Uh, those, there is no other country in the world that uh, produces natural gas or oil to the extent that Canada does that can boast that kind of a record. In other words, it's not taking, uh, you know, a prime minister showing up at an international conference to show how tough he is on an industry that's actually producing results. More importantly, you know, you, you alluded to it. If you're one quarter of the, of the issue or the problem as you perceive it, why aren't the other three quarters uh, involved as well? And this is not to slight any other industry. Uh, but we're, if we're all in this together, and apparently, uh, according to our Supreme Court, uh, you know, uh, international emissions matter. It's why the federal government has jurisdiction to, uh, to uh, regulate them. Why are we not doing this uh, collectively from coast to coast? And so I think the point is we've already done it. We're doing it. And some would argue, including William Nordhaus, the economist, uh, well known for his work on climate, says, you know, you do not put one, two or three taxes and regulations on top of that. You want to make sure one works very efficiently. So I have my doubts, but uh, I'm always willing to answer these questions. Does the federal government have a credibility issue uh, by putting a hard cap, yet it owns a pipeline and subsidizes the industry? Well, this is a government that uh, accepts billions of dollars in foreign charitable organizations coming into the country and uh, demonizing one particular industry. This is a government that spends a lot of its time blocking pipelines, shutting them down, bringing in regulations, C-48, C-69, uh, both to ensure that uh, only vessels on the Pacific coast uh, carrying oil are not allowed to come into, except for Vancouver, the lower part, uh, versus allowing it inconsistently uh, within Atlantic Canada. Uh, this is a government that has taken the view that uh, uh, you know, you can uh, you can go after one industry with, uh, while excluding all others. And I think that's the problem. It's not just the credibility. It's that I think Canadians get it, mm -hmm. but I think Canadians also have some pretty strong questions, as does the uh, Bank of Canada, uh, as does uh, analysts who just a couple of days ago, in fact, yesterday we heard from Black Box Reporter that suggested the uh, government is about to embark uh, through the deputy uh, uh, chairman of the Bank of Canada on a on a, on a period of significant dislocation and economic disruption. I don't think Canadians are saying we shouldn't do this, but if the cost of doing this outweighs the benefit, then I think Canadians are going to have uh, some pretty strong pushback because they're now going to see the totality of what they're trying to achieve. And at the end of the day, if what we're really talking about is only Canada becomes the, uh, the target of doing these things, what of the rest of the world? And I think that's a legitimate question. Now, you brought up uh, the clean fuel standard, and it didn't get much face time at, at COP26. Uh, how do you see that impacting Canadians? I think it's going to be the one that really wakes them up. Now, even before we get there, let's understand that uh, the energy crisis globally is now starting to hit in the way that uh, certainly exceeds those who believe, uh, rightly or wrongly, that there is a climate crisis or climate emergency. But those commentaries aside, what I mean by the energy crisis is that for the past four or five years globally, and for the past 10 years, there has been a strategy of disinvestment in the oil and gas sector, and it's starting to bite, not just in terms of uh, Canada's uh, poor economic performance and on its inability to send its number one product to market. It's also important, I think, from the perspective of the weaker Canadian dollar, which is contributing to a much higher than expected cost of living for everyone. And we're starting to see that not just in energy, obviously, but in food. So the clean fuel standard, uh, you know, if and when it is implemented, um, will only make matters worse. Uh, because, of course, what we're really seeing here is, and this is the only thing I didn't hear from the prime minister or the leaders at COP26 was we want demand destruction. 
We don't want you using natural gas to heat your homes or propane. We don't want you using furnace oil if you happen to be in the Maritimes or Atlantic Canada where there is no alternative to heat your home. We want to ensure that uh, our farms and our forestry industry, as well as our manufacturing and energy sector, uh, conform with what will effectively be a reduction in economic uh, activity. I'm just not sure, Ed, that Canadians are prepared, much less understand the totality of what they're supporting. You know, the the economy here is still recovering from the pandemic and oil and gas industry very large in this country. It's being targeted here. Should Canada be handing out money to help other countries achieve their targets? No. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact is we've already given out tens of millions of dollars to green organizations to lobby the government to bring out uh, and about more, you know, inefficient green schemes, none of which really work in reality. Now, look, this is not something that most of us here in my province, in our province here of Ontario, uh, are unfamiliar with. We had similar uh, moves towards sprinkling money around, telling people it would be jobs, and then giving money to other jurisdictions. Uh, I remember Morris Strong, a fellow who I worked with uh, or had the pleasure of working with back in 1978, he ran as a Liberal candidate, by the way, in Scarborough, uh, saying, you know, we'll buy a billion dollars of hydro money to buy some uh, rainforests in Brazil. I think the federal government is uh, is duty bound to looking after the priorities of Canadians, and it may be lost on this current crop of liberals, but it isn't on uh, some of us old timers. By the way, I'm 59, so that makes me an old timer uh, in in, uh, <laughs> in the so called neoliberal party. You may want to start to consider the fact that the country is uh, approaching a, a brink. Uh, it may not be able to recover financially from that brink. And so promising to commit money uh, to other jurisdictions, to other places around the world when you haven't got your own act together, worse, when you fail to appreciate that we have had a strong menu of diverse, clean energy. Ontario, we've had, uh, you know, a Green Energy Act, you know, imposed on us, even though we had nuclear, even though we had hydro, this is nothing new. And yes, we did shut down coal long before it was trendy. And we get no credit for it when we sign agreements like the one in Paris. But I digress. I think it's uh, it's wrongheaded for the, for the government to make those pledges, particularly when the priorities of Canadians and our objectives are not yet met. But it does suggest to me uh, that the government is cherry picking, picking and choosing. Yeah, we'll give a couple billion to another country. But we'll say nothing of China and India. We will say nothing of Australia. We will say nothing of Russia. That's basically thumbing their nose at Canada and saying, if you guys want to exit the oil and gas sector at a time when demand is shooting up, we haven't made that so-called transition. Fill your boots, Canadians, but be prepared for a significant decrease in your standard of living, thanks to this government and its myopical uh, approach to uh, uh, a, a policy that's very one-sided. Dan, I want to thank you for joining us. Good to be here, Ed. Thanks for having me. Dan McTaggs, the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. A big announcement to come out of COP26 this week was that the world's financial industry, banks, investors, insurance companies with $130 trillion behind them is pledging to focus on climate change through its work. Doug Ald is a professor in the Department of Economics and Finance at the University of Guelph, and he joins us now. And Doug, $130 trillion. Is that more shock than awe? Well, it's certainly a lot of awe. It depends on where that's going to be focused. But uh, given the size of the global economy, it's still a big number. Uh, the key is is how to get the private sector involved. How, how do you see uh, that you know trying to get these financial people involved in climate change? I think many companies. I don't think many companies have uh, set goals for themselves in terms of either net zero carbon emissions or cutting emissions by a certain percentage. Uh, the thing that I think bothers a lot of people is that those dates are. Some of the earliest, maybe a few at 2025, but years like 2030, 2035, 2040, uh, that's a long way out. And with no specific plans as to how that money might be spent or allocated, you know, in the next uh, 12 to 24 months, means you're wondering whether two years from now people will be saying, yes, our commitment for, for 2030 still stands. And you get to 2026, then they move it forward to 2035, and nothing has happened. Um, so there's, there's a lack of really what I would call clear strategic thinking, clear uh, planning and a strategy that would set reasonable goals and some way of auditing those goals, you know, certainly on an annual basis.
And, and I think the the issue for for a lot of them is there doesn't seem to be you know across the board standard for that, right? It just seems to be sort of hit and miss, you know, depending on where you are. Well, that's true. I mean, for example, a financial institution might be uh, uh, financing a uh, let, let's say an oil producer. Uh, to upgrade their refinery because it needs upgrades after 10 years. In doing those upgrades, of course, uh, the uh, carbon emissions from many, many components of new equipment are less carbon intensive than they were 10 years ago. And so that's automatically uh, considered to be an investment in green energy production because it has less of a carbon footprint. Uh, how close that brings you to a particular target depends on setting a target and keeping to it over a reasonable period of time. And do you think that's part of the problem is, is trying to, to stay with the target? It seems that, you know, if it looks it's too farther out, then they just reduce or lower their, their target, what they're trying to get to or what they're trying to accomplish. I think there's an element of truth in that. Um, there is very little in the way of a, um, I would say generally recognized global verifiable um, check on the commitments that companies make and countries make. I mean, if you look at the commitments that uh, countries made at Paris and you look at where they are now, there's very, very few countries in the world that have actually achieved what they set out to achieve by the year 2021. Um, so the same would be true with respect to um, the financial institutions uh, and what are the targets going to be how are they going to reach them? And are they going to start on January 1st, 2022 to work towards those targets? You know, since 2015, the financial industry has invested well, over $4 trillion in oil, gas, and coal. Uh, you know, obviously, they do that for, uh, for the money coming back. But uh, do you see them getting out of it if they're not going to get the returns? Well, you know, there's a lot of talk about stranded assets. Uh, as new renewables come on stream, then the stuff that's uh, in the ground, whether it's gas or oil, um, and certainly the discussion up until probably less than a year ago, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion about those stranded assets. And all of a sudden we find uh, countries which are uh, freezing. We find countries like China, which cannot uh, produce enough electricity. They have blackouts. They have rationing of electricity because they don't have enough renewable energy. Uh, they run out of coal. They don't buy coal from Australia because they're mad at Australia. So geopolitics is actually forcing uh, the people of China to have to, uh, uh, you know, undergo a pretty tough, tough winter coming up. Uh, it's, it's all wound up in combination of the, of, the, of the politics amongst the countries with the environment and with the economy. And so unless you can um, pull yourself out of that uh, in terms of setting specific goals and how you're going to achieve them, um, I think there's a lot of skepticism about goals that are 10, 15, 20, 30 years out. Um, nice talk, but what does it really mean? You know, we've heard a lot about companies sitting on dead money instead of uh, investing. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if this might help get some of that money flowing again. Well, companies aren't going to invest money if there's no return. And so you have to take, ask yourself, where is the medium to long term return on investing in a particular asset. And certainly investing in renewable assets has taken off to a large extent. And um, I think we, in terms of where we were 10 years ago, we've made great progress in the development of renewable uh, sources for, for energy, but it's still only supplying uh, in many cases, a small percentage of the current energy needs. And if you look at energy needs out 10 years, are the renewals going to be able to catch up with that? And what incentives can government put into place that will encourage that, uh, that, that capital if, or that dead, dead money, as you call it? What's going to encourage a company to say, all right, we'll spend $100 million on financing a renewable project because um, we're, going to, um, we're going to get some kind of incentive. It might be a tax incentive, whatever. Uh, and it makes, our worth, it makes worthwhile doing that. What impact, if any, do you see for Canada from the pledges made by Canada at COP26? Well, I know the Prime Minister has uh, been speaking very strongly about a global carbon tax. Um, and it, this seems to be a, 
based on the fact that um, we have achieved a global minimum corporate tax uh, coming out of um, re reasonable, I, I think, goal was achieved. And in, in implementation is going to be an important thing. But the thinking is that if you can have a global minimum corporate tax, maybe you could have a global minimum carbon tax. But in the case of having a global um, a minimum tax, um, that's fairly easily, I shouldn't say easily, but it, it's doable. It can be done with structures amongst the countries. You can have checks and balances. You can have auditing of what's going on. But to try to get a, the countries around the world, or at least the majority of the polluting countries, to adapt a common carbon tax, we've got to start then defining what is a carbon emission and what would be the implications on an economy. So if an economy finds that it's going to be very expensive to have a carbon tax, jobs will take precedent over you know, imposing that kind of a, a tax. And I, I would imagine be, when you consider China and India are number one and three in terms of emitters, uh, if they don't sign on, it doesn't seem like a much of the, this is going to do any good anyway. No, I mean, the, it's going to do some good. I mean, even even if you look at, say, the European Union, which uh, as a collectivity of, of countries um, has done reasonably well compared to other parts of the world, um, if they hadn't done the things they've been doing the last 10 years, uh, there would be a higher level of carbon emissions in the world. So, and it's the argument that some people make about Canada not doing anything because we only contribute a very small percentage of the emissions. But if you add up all those small percentages from all the small countries, they start to get not the same as the United States or China, uh, but they're starting to be, uh, actually produce meaningful changes in the carbon emissions. Doug, I want to thank you for joining us. It's been my pleasure, Ed. All the best with your show. Doug Alt, a professor in the Department of Economics and Finance at the University of Guelph. Our unpublished vote question asks, will Canada's pledges at COP26 make a difference in climate change? Yes, no, or unsure. You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote and have your voice heard. I want to thank our guest today on the Unpublished Cafe, Angela Keller Herzog, Executive Director of Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability, Dan McTagg with Canadians for Affordable Energy, and Doug Ald from the University of Guelph. And I want to thank you for watching the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.